everybody. Welcome to the December meeting of the Community Awareness uh, Committee for 2021. And um, we've sent you the agenda, so you guys should have that in your email. Um, and we're just going to go ahead and start moving through it. Um, social media. Um, I thought I would just quickly look at the numbers um, for November. Um, we mostly just did like rustic outdoorsy stuff as kind of like our general theme. Um, we reached about 7,000 people, so it was a little bit lower than our normal where I aim for 10,000 or more, but it still was a good month. Um, and, and November does tend to be a dip between October and December, which tend to do really well. So not a bad month. Um, our most popular posts uh, related to Yates Mill. Um, people really seem to like hearing about that history. Um, and we got 15 new followers on our Facebook, so that's always good that we're moving in a positive direction. Um, and our Instagram. I can take a quick look. Okay. Yeah. So our Instagram, we now have 270 followers. Uh, so again, those numbers are going up as well. Um, and that's just the brief overview. It wasn't like a big thrilling month. Uh, December should be a little bit more exciting. And then as we start to have more um, real world stuff that we're working on, that'll give us even more to, to post about. Um, looks like the next thing on the agenda is the LGBTQIA plus study is closed. Uh, the survey is closed. I hope we got some good um, memories and information shared with us there. Um, we did post about it a couple of times. Um, I see here deconstruction of the web page FYI ongoing staff project. Is there something that someone wants to say about that? Just an update and it may be something that the RHTC would like to promote on social media sometime in early next year. Um, uh, it's been a little over a month or so ago that the city council looked at the potential for a deconstruction ordinance citywide um, that ultimately was recommended not to move forward, but they wanted um, a resource guide that developers and homeowners could use to make people that are interested in pursuing deconstruction of their his historic or otherwise um, buildings with materials that could be reused and not sent to the landfill. Um, make it easier for them to pursue that. Um, so we're working on a city web page that will kind of, you know, go into the basics of what deconstruction is and why it's useful and provide a list of um, contractors and architectural salvage warehouses within the state um, to help with that. Um, so that's due to be delivered by the end of the calendar year. Um, so maybe January or February, it would be worth pushing out that web page. Okay, good to know. Thank you for the update and just keep us updated. And yeah, we'll definitely add that to something that we'll um, push out on social media. And speaking of social media and getting information out there to the community, uh, we wanted to briefly talk about the Ligon House and Seaboard Station today. Um, I'm sure some of you have seen the emails about the Ligon House and that um, it's for sale. Uh, Ian wrote a great article about it in the News and Observer. I'm working on an article um, as well, but uh, we've got some holdups on my end because it's different, uh, because it's not an editorial. I have to be able to talk to like the developer and the real estate agent and all of that in order to give a holistic view. So uh, it takes a little bit longer on our end. Um, or I might just end up doing a generic article on the history of the house, depending. But um, we do have uh, to talk about how we want to approach that on social media. And then today we got an email. I, um, I think did Curtis sing it? 
uh, send it um, about Seaboard Station and that the owners are selling uh, Seaboard Station. So um, I guess I can just open that up. And, and Gaston, you've sort of been pushing a lot of this stuff uh, in the email being kind of the the person making sure that this stuff's getting moving. Do you have anything to say about that before we get into that discussion? Now, can you hear me? Uh, real quick, if you can't find the email, I'll send it again, but it was just a summary of the two issues, uh, Ligon and, and Seaboard Station, and it's an alert that was prompted in part by Travis and or um, Curtis's heads up, and it was, um, anyway, so I'll, I'll resend it again. It was just a synopsis of the, uh, an alert. It's called alert, blah, 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 blah. Everybody got it. If you don't, I'll send it again in a second. I'm at a, remote location on anyway the, the issue is that ligand house has not been closed yet and it is likely that they want the land for something because it's probably umpteen million dollars worth of land so we gotta be put all our feelers out and try based on some comments that were made in city council meeting this afternoon tiny if i'm not right correct me I believe that the heads up was we might be able to save the house, but definitely land might be out of our reach because the value of the land is so intense. But I'm not following sure that was what I got from the councilman. That's the impression that I got from from him too. But it that's I think um, I think it's all speculative at this point, depending on who ends up purchasing it. What what does everybody suggest as the Ligon House? What do you all suggest is the best way to get to the root of who's buying it and how to open up a dialogue with them? I, I guess we can search the records. I I don't know who amongst the twelve of us knows how to the most precise. Well, and staff the 50, the 50, fifteen of us has the most direct information about this. The option, the options would be to save the house and the land that's immediately underneath it and let them develop around it. That would be preferable. That's true. The only outlet that I'm aware of is to wait and see who buys it. And then that will be a public record and we could um, contact them. I, it would obviously be preferable to find out who's buying it and get in touch with them because once they've purchased it and settled on a price that will be with a project in mind. Surely, yeah. um, and you a budget in mind, but I, I don't know of another way other than somebody who plays inside baseball telling the committee. I, I'm thinking, so. Aaron, might be if nobody objects, I think it might be worth me to send or somebody to send another email to the full board and uh, commission and staff saying, if you know information in, inside the ballpark information, let us know what it is so that we can do exactly what Aaron suggested. Uh, at least the earliest read we can get on what their intentions are the best. Now we have, we have history and we have the city council probably on our side, but developers have a lot of money. So we have to, I think we need to be as proactive as we can possibly be. Uh, I'm trying to pull it up in IMAPS now. There hasn't been a rezoning case filed for the land, has there? Well, uh, Colette says that she doesn't know of one. Okay. Yeah. If that would be the only thing I could possibly think of that would kind of tip the hand because if it was contingent on a rezoning, we could find out that way. Otherwise, until it closes, I don't know any other way. Travis, do you see the acreage on that description? Uh, IMAPS is not cooperating with me right now. Give me a moment and I'll let you know. Okay, thank you. It came up in city council's, the report we made to city council today. <clears throat> and so did uh, Lustra. And so did the cards that we used, the historic cards. No, uh, what, what did they say? They were, as Tanya reminded me, because I was looking for compliments from Tanya, they, they, uh, I, I had a moment, I'd taken these drugs because obviously my face hit the 
I have stitches all over my face inside and out, and I'm on drugs. But uh, uh, she said that they seemed to be attentive and focused on what I was saying, even if it was inartfully constructed. So mm -hmm. they, they were very attentive to what I was saying about both the Ligon and the Lustron house. And I think it bears, and the cards, and I think they all bear following up. Uh, I promised them a set of base, their own baseball type cards for each city council member, but I want to package that into a push for the Ligon house and, the, and, and anything else that we think is endangered right now mm -hmm. as a package after the holiday rush, you know? Yeah. So I'm going to need the help from somebody to reprint those cards, at least for the city council members and their staff. And the clerk of the city council needs a set too. Travis is still digging. I it has it has pulled up the Ligon Middle School. I am trying to get it to point to five seven three East Lenore Street, but it seems fixated on the middle school. Okay, and Tanya or the staff, uh, Colette or Aaron, help me with the link to our. I think it would be good for this committee to see. The color they've seen it before, but it might help to re-see the the report that we rendered today that they have in their hands because it it prominently displays the um, baseball style cards in in our summary, and I think it was a great staff and the uh, communication staff did a great job piecing together what I think is a very attractive ten page, but it's uh, it's got a lot of graphics and so it's easy to digest. Um, I've got it pulled up now. So there's actually, it appears to be two lots are part of the property. One of them is kind of a L-shaped lot that includes the house. And part of the house's driveway is on a separate um, lot. So the lot with the house, it's residential lists and 10 acres, 0.32 acres. Hmm. is the um, the size of the lot with the house and then the empty lot next to it that includes part of the house's driveway is an additional 0. 0.12 acres and they have different owners according to the records. See that last phrase? They have different, the, the, the lot, the lots have different owners. There's not all one owner. Uh, yeah, and, and this is if I'm looking at this correctly. So this is 573 East Lenore Street is the is the address, right? Um, so one of the lots that has like a part of the driveway of the house, it looks like, but no other structures on the on the lot um, has a different owner listed than the one who owns the lot with the house on it. Okay, thank you. So, Madam Chair, I'll I'll resend uh, I'll resend a request, all points request to the commission. That some of our commissioner members have far more inside information than I do, and and they're not encumbered by. Um, the rules in which the staff may or may not be able to tell us certain things based on insider information they know. So we'll 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 see if we can come up with some information from the from the commissioners, some of whom know all the inside parties on a lot of these things. It might be good, Heather, to think uh, how much did you say we've touched on Ligon in the in our social media outreach. We haven't yet. That was what this I, I, I wanted to discuss it at the meeting. Um, okay. Because we want to be careful. Um, I talked to um, um, my manager about it when working on the story. And we just we want to be careful because we want to save the history, but we also don't want to upset the real estate agents trying to sell it or undermine them. In in that, the family is the one selling the house, and because the family is the one selling the house, 
because they can't afford the taxes and they can't afford the upkeep. You know, it's it's a tricky balancing act, I think, uh, where, of course, we want to save the house and save the history. But if the family themselves doesn't Understand. want to save the house. Yeah, we ran into the same situation with Oberlin Village. We had a, a controlling interest of a family who sold a parcel and the uncontrolling interest went ballistic. But wasn't anything friends of Oberlin Village could do about it because it was a family selling the property. Exactly. So, you know, it's it's a tricky situation where we, we want to make sure it's clear that there's a lot of history there. We don't want it to be lost. But, you know, we also don't want to make it seem like RHDC, which is like, you know, a, a city organization is has some level of, you know. Um, is it is it too late to see if there are any. Tax breaks, beneficials, historic designations, anything that we can do to to get our express our interest in preservation of the house somehow. I mean, it the is on the go ahead, Cliff. I was gonna say it's it's already included in the East Raleigh South Park National Register District. And so um Potentially, you know, uh, eligible for rehabilitation tax credits. Uh, you know, if that's feasible, the question it's also um, on our uh, potential landmark list. So a future owner could, um, you know, work with us on getting it landmark, and then it would be fifty percent property tax deferral. But that's just sharing information with ultimately who. So, so we kind of need more information, don't we, to decide which approach to take. At this point, Something. the only person that we know who to contact is the listing agent. So we could contact the listing agent and request that they share this type of information on behalf of the RHDC. Um, I think that's the only step we could take right now. And then we would need to wait to see who purchases the property un unless we know what? somehow. Why don't we contact the listing agent, which I doubt will get a really warm and fuzzy response, but it, I think we ought to contact them anyway, right? Um, could I would assume, assume that the listing agent, if they have seen Ian's blog post and the n and article, is, is not feeling great about um, the historic publicity. Uh, due to the way that the property is advertised. Um, but, you know, we, we can certainly contact them and share our perspective and offer those potential financial incentives for the people that may buy the property. Um, it could, it could help them to sell it. It could not, but it, that would be up to them. Well, uh, staff can pull together the information. I think an email coming from either you Gaston or um, or the research committee would be the way to go as opposed to to staff. We've got you know a letter, and you're muted, Gaston. Um, we've got a letter that we can provide, or we can just copy that and put it into email form so they don't have to open another document. Okay, I'll if you'll help me with that, I'll run with that and and put on my warm and fuzzy face. I think we should see how they react. And I don't think we should fear being aggressive. The time for being aggressive about historically significant properties needs to be over. And I know the staff has some limitations, but. Just real quick, I wanted, and not to say that we should give up on saving the structure. Absolutely not, but it, it would be prudent kind of in parallel, um, to be considering options to best preserve what we can of the house if we are unable to save it, whether that's by moving it or um, otherwise. We do, you know, have the opportunities to go out and take pictures and photographs of the home, but that's kind of limited in terms of what that gives us to reflect back on the property should it be destroyed. Um, would it be an option to start looking at vendors for things like 3D 
imagery where we take 3D scans of the building itself for building like a uh, VR experience or somewhat. I'm not, again, I'm not saying we give up on saving the house, but given the funds we have available, uh, that would be better than just having regular old pictures. Well, if we have funds, uh, that might be a good idea, but what, what about seeing if staff can find out the next available suitable lot nearby if we had to figure out a way to move it? No. I mean, we're not going to know. I mean, there are, there are no city lots available. Okay. Um, so anything that is available is going to be. You know, well, we could. Property. Is this a recorded meeting? Yes. Yes. Okay. I was just getting ready to say something impertinent, but I won't. Um, and then upload it to YouTube. Tanya, um, as part of the discussion around the Ligon House on the agenda, we were potentially going to discuss um, kind of where that where that line should be in terms of staff or the committee or the full commission's ability to kind of move on topics like this and whether or not to, you know, reference the potential landmarks list and, and other things when working. I know Heather's still actively working on her article. So that was a question that she had for us. Is there any clarity that you can give on staff's role in this type of stuff, the committee's role? I mean, staff's role is going to be just providing the factual information and then, you know, initial contact with, you know, an agent or potential purchaser or the, the owner would be with the um, with a, with the commission. And then if they have any further questions, they beating the new property owner, they can reach out to staff with, you know, what it would mean to be a landmark. I think if you're speaking to someone directly, it's okay to say this is a property that the commission knows about as being historically significant and, you know, and eligible become a Raleigh Historic Landmark until we publish the landmarks list. Um, it's I, I'm a little uh, wary mentioning it in social media because people are going to go look for it and it's not out there. Um, well, let's so. let's proceed this way if it's okay with you, Heather and Travis, incorporating your ideas it, it, and, and, and Tanya. Uh, if you would help me with some background information to go to the real estate agent and I will express our concerns and interests uh, carefully. And uh, we also, if, if amongst yourselves, if you would talk and see if you know of any 3D, anybody can do 3D kind of work and if they can give us a bid, I'm sure we got to go through some bidding process or whatever. And then, um, I'll coordinate with staff and with the research committee, the approach. Uh, the research committee is um, going to be seeking a new leader uh, shortly uh, because Susan has now been um, hired as the acting executive director for CAM for a year to get their house in order after Gab Smith uh, retired. Um, so we'll go, go there if that's okay with everybody. And I'll report back to you guys what, if anything, we learn. Does that work? I don't have anything else to do. I'm not going home for Christmas. Just kidding. I have a mild concussion, so you know I could say anything right now. Except there's an empty lot by Jim Anthony's house. Um. Okay. All right, Heather, you ready for the next item? I am. Um. I am. Um. So, so just to clarify, though, we should not talk about the Ligon House on social media or Seaboard Station as of right now, except to maybe just say their history, but nothing about them being sold. Well, I think it's a public record. It's been in and out. I think you can talk about both. Unless okay. staff vehemently disagree, since it's not anything nobody who 
gets a, or reads an online newspaper wouldn't know about. That makes sense. Okay. Um, the 60th and anniversary. Yeah. 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 Have an angel who wants to buy the, you know, Heather, the before we move on, I, I think the only question that we had remaining in terms of being able to address it in social media was whether or not to point to the potential landmarks list. So what I'm hearing from Tanya is once that is finalized and published, um, assuming that it is published, uh, then at that point it would be you could freely link to it. Um, so maybe we we're just avoiding questions. When we get the link, we can republish. For now, simply saying that it's known to be historically significant is um, that works. Okay, so let's move on. Um, anniversary. Um, so we were sent a couple of ideas from people. Um, uh, the RHDC collectible card. Do we want to do First Presbyterian or Yates Mill? Is the first question we have up here. Um, what are you guys thinking? I have my own opinions, but I, I want to hear from you guys first. Um, I'm curious, where, how did we come up with those two, two options or were those suggestions from people or, um. Yeah, so Yates Mill, I believe it's because it's the oldest landmark or the first landmark. And first Presbyterian, uh, Aaron, I didn't put this one on here, so I'm going to ask you. Sure. So we had discussed um, maybe going back to, you know, something original, OG, whatever, for this card as a special edition for the anniversary. So Yates Mill is, Yates Mill is the oldest, um, believed oldest by construction date, um, Raleigh Historic Landmark. And Presbyterian... Uh, first Presbyterian is the first designated landmark, and I think Colette clarified there are actually 12 landmarks designated at this first city council meeting where we created landmarks, but um, by case number, I guess, the First Presbyterian Church takes it. That makes sense. Um, Katie, did you have another suggestion? No, I was just curious what the significance of those were, but... Um, I kind of lean towards the eighth mill personally. Um, okay. What about you, Gaston and Travis? It feels more significant because of because of the the age to me versus the designation date. Mm -hmm. I think they're they're great to go with. Um, I don't know if there'd be an opportunity to expand the number of cards we do if I volunteer to help out. Um, but the only other ones I'd throw in the ring are. Uh, a, a lot of people know the the current Raleigh Times building, but one of the things I don't think a lot of people realize is their second office, which is directly across the street from Nash Square, um, is still standing. It just has one of those very um, 90s facades on the building. Uh, it'd be interesting to have like a card that's got like a picture of the of the building before the facade was put on and then its current day state on the other side. Uh, the other building, which is also close to Nash Square, it's not a, neither of these are landmarks, by the way, um, is the original Union Station building. Mm -hmm. So I think those are both, I, I, those are good ideas. I like them. I think they'd be popular. Um, my concern would be just that we've been doing landmarks so far. Um, and so we would have to, I guess, determine, do we want to make this set eventually to just be like, you know, the cards of historic landmarks, or do we want this set to be more, you know, um, can't think of a word, like more malleable, you know, it could be kind of any historically significant thing. Um, so I think that would be, we would have to decide like, our vision for the future of the cards in general. Um, but I also think those would be really good cards. Um, and we are going to decide cards that we do for the year. Um, is there a reason, though, that you think those should be the special edition uh, for like the 60th anniversary? Uh, no, not in particular. It's just the only two that I could think of that are like 
quote unquote kind of hidden in plain sight. Mm -hmm. But to your point, if we're going to keep the things with landmarks, obviously those would not be candidates. It's just kind of a figuring out as we see more and more of these landmarks disappear or potential landmarks slip through our slip through the grass before we're able to put any sort of protections on them. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> helping people realize, well, these things are still here. If you care about them, we've got an opportunity. That's that's a good point. Um, I definitely think a hundred percent if you wouldn't mind um hold on real quick. Field a lot's been added here. Would you mind emailing me those two things? Um, I was going to add them here to the my document, but there's been a lot added, so I don't want to like mess it up. I do think those would be perfect social media candidates. Something to like highlight on social media at at bare minimum. If not future cards, then at least I do agree that that's exactly the kind of thing we could talk about on social media and like make sure people are aware. Um, and they definitely could be candidates for um, for cards that we talk about throughout the year because uh, we we do want to discuss um, what cards we want to make this this year. Um, though as far as the special edition 60th anniversary, I do think it should be something that there's like an obvious specialness to it, like it's the oldest landmark or the first landmark. Um, we could also do a landmark that's 60 years old right that relates to the 60th anniversary um and another person mentioned um like sir walter you know something that's like very obviously like this is the special edition card because it's it stands out in some way um some way extra all of our cards should be something that stand out um on that note then do you have a preference between first presbyterian or yates mill if you had to choose between just those two I'm going to make just one comment there and just, I don't think Yates Mill is in the city limits. Mm -hmm. And so that is a bit of information. I, uh, Which may or may not matter, but. Like not in the city limits, like it's in the ETJ or is it? Okay. Correct. I don't, I don't think. I mean. I mean for this purpose, it may not matter. Practically speaking, it just means any certificates of appropriateness are heard by the Wake County Historic Preservation Commission and not RHDC. It's still a Raleigh Historic Landmark. Well, I guess I'm just over cautious, but I'm guessing some people might want to know why we picked a church, a single church. And our response needs to be apparent that it's old. <laughs> Yeah, it's a good point too. Um, I I will say, personally, I do think Yates Mill is great because it's the you know it's the quote oldest or because of its significant age, but also just because it's popular and people know what it is. And I think that alone would make people, <coughs> you know, really want that card. Um, plus we have some just some great photos of Yates Mill that we could use that would just really, um. That's what I'm leaning towards. Um, I definitely see the concern about it not being in the city limit. Is it a Raleigh city landmark? It is. I think that would be enough then. If if the if what we're saying is these cards are Raleigh city landmarks, then it it meets the you know the uh, the bare minimum requirements, right, of being a city landmark. And then if it's the quote oldest or the oldest known uh bill date then i i think it makes it to, to me that makes it a shoe in but i you know i um yeah i agree with you heather and i think yeah it's popular like so many people have been there and are familiar with it and you know have their own memories there so it uh i think it's it means more to people than yeah a single single church and yeah there's another little bonus. I have a friend who's far more adventuresome about engaging in local things, and they like to go to places where they can walk around. It's kind of hard to walk around church when the doors are locked a lot of times. But Yates Mill is like a park, and there's there's something to see there, and it's destination kind of historical thing. Yeah. Okay. I I agree with that. Are we are we okay saying Yates Mill? Would everyone be okay slash happy with that? 
Yeah, I'm yeah, seeing some me. nodding heads. Yeah. Okay. All right. Let's do that. And then um, I, I do agree. I think that's going to be popular and that people people would actually probably clamor for that card because they, they like Yates Mill. Um, so I think it's a good, a good special edition card, especially if we only offer it um, at this event or at very unique times. Uh, I think people would want that card. So, all right. So here's the biggie. Um, what to do with the event. Now, we have several suggestions from the group. Um, we have, excuse me, um, just hosting a talk. And we have kind of like ideas big and small, right? We have host a talk in the park, you know, just kind of like a, a history talk. Um, I give history talks a lot. They tend to be pretty popular, just like a just a history talk. People tend to really like that kind of stuff. We could give it at the park or at the museum um, and just kind of host a talk and come up with a great topic and be pretty simple. People come, we could have swag, we could have the selfie station with the backdrop that we made a few years ago. We could have some activities or, you know, some giveaways um, and go very simple. And I don't think that would be very expensive. Um, and it would be pretty simple to put together, but I, I think effective. I think if we have a great topic, people are going to come out. Um, similarly, we could do that same type of thing, but we could put it in a historic venue that people would want to go to. If we could get inside Heck Andrews House, for example, I think people would come just to get to see Heck Andrews House. The other thing we could do is put it in the core museum or Joel Lane House, and that way we have a partner in promoting the event. Alternatively, we could put it in a restaurant, maybe like the Raleigh Times, and we could have them create like a special, we could have drink specials, um, food specials, people could eat and listen to our program. Um, and then that restaurant could help promote the event too. Um, and then they would benefit by getting business. We would benefit by them promoting us. And it would be in a really fun uh, location. Maybe if we did like Raleigh Times, we could have them show their downstairs uh, where there's actually remnants of like the old newspaper building and everything down there in their basement. Um, so Heather, people... can I jump in? I, I know we've got all this kind of brainstormed out on our agenda to look at right now. Um, I just wanted to throw in to the mix here. I've spent a good portion of this afternoon kind of trying to think through mm -hmm. some, some brainstorming of how this might be accomplished and where and when. Um, and I think last month or maybe the month before that, we discussed trying to pair this up with other events that are naturally occurring downtown as a way to kind of get the heavy lift mm -hmm. for us um, and have people already in the area um, coming to an event and Tanya noted that our explosion occurs Ooh. on, it's a, they shut down Fayetteville street and there's lots of tents. Um, so it's a pedestrian corridor festival and that happens on May 21st and 22nd. Nice. So this could be as simple as us renting a booth, um, at our explosion, setting up our selfie station, getting our swag together, um, kind of. And, and, and people will be readily coming by um, as a part of that festival. That's a great idea. And it's preservation month. Yep. Right. And we had already decided to do something in May for preservation month. So um, I think that's a clever idea. Plus there'll be foot traffic. Yep. That's a great idea. And we could come up with some, some cool stuff to have at the table to draw people over. Kind of like we did at that event a couple of years ago, we could have another scavenger hunt with a prize, um, you know, something fun that makes people come to our table and then we automatically have foot traffic and it costs us a lot less money uh, <laughs> because we're just doing a table. Um, yeah, I like that idea. And even if we could get a booth perhaps in front of a landmark as well. Um, yeah, be, that would be great. That would be a great idea. And I mean, if we wanted to expand it, we could offer like, um, as part of the thing, we could offer like maybe a historic tour of Fayetteville Street um, every hour or two, or we could say as part of the event at three o'clock, we'll have a tour if people want to come. Maybe Art Explosure would even put us on their um, 
like their guide and say like at three o'clock one of the events is RHDC hosts a historic tour of Fayetteville Street. Um, you know, if we want it, if we wanted to expand it, we don't have to. Um, okay. Uh, just for the sake of other people's ideas so that they're listed, um, we did have the suggestion of a bike tour or maybe uh, doing like a trolley tour, teaming up with the city. And then the, the biggest suggestion we had, and I think it's a cool suggestion, I'm just not sure if we could afford it, uh, was a huge birthday party inviting 60 years of former commissioners, politicians, staff, residents of historic districts, the media, and the public, and we'd have it with food trucks, and uh, we could have tables, kind of like we're holding, hosting our own art explosure in a, a history explosure. Um, other historic places could have tables there. Um, we would highlight major accomplishments that we've done uh, for the past 60 years, and we would partner with Burning Coal Theater to do a historic piece on Raleigh history, which I do think would be kind of cool. Um, and then restaurants and historic structures could have food stands, developers with a career in preservation could sponsor or help out. That was like the biggest suggestion that was sent to us. And I obviously, I think it's really cool. Um, I'm concerned if we would, that would be a huge thing to do though. I mean, that would become like all our committee does for the next several months is plan that. Plus we would need money, but I wanted to read it um, because obviously it's a neat idea. I'm, you know, just wondering. I think we could wrap in like some iteration of that, especially, I don't know like how well our record keeping is like with all the different types of contacts that we have, but I think if we made uh, attempt to reach out to those groups, at least if we did go the art exposure route and include mm -hmm. them um, with like a special invitation or something like that, um, mm -hmm. And yeah, like and, and centralized we, it a little bit. And we still could ask Burning Coal to do like a street piece. Um, I've seen that kind of thing before at SparkCon. Um, oh, I'm feeling better now, guys. Um, I've seen that thing before at like SparkCon where they've had like a theater troupe come and like do like a five minute street performance and they do it like, you know, on the hour every hour or something. Um, so I mean, we, we could, we could bolster up our table as much as we want um, at Art Explosure. Um, so, uh, thoughts? Do you guys have a preference? It seems like we're leaning away, but I, you know, I want to see what you guys think before I just say we're. I'm interested to hear about this NFT situation. <laughs> oh yes, yes. What is this NFT? Um, I apologize. I had to turn off my webcam. I got the cleaning people coming in and everyone in the house, including the dogs, are kind of cramming into this little office here. <laughs> um, you wanted me to go over the NFT thing? Yes, please. Okay. Um, this was just an idea that I had over the past couple months. I've been dabbling in uh, cryptocurrency just as a hobby, and I don't... Number one, you're not, I don't believe that anybody should invest a ton of money in this stuff, but there are, there's a lot of hype and excitement around it right now. Um, and people are eagerly supporting um, projects that some are worthwhile and some are just, you know, absolutely crazy what people are spending money on. Uh, so, given a lot of our hardships with preserving properties kind of come down to us not having the money to be able to do it, uh, I was, racking my brain over how can we potentially raise some money without having to spend a whole lot of money in the attempt. And the idea was utilizing these, um, the hype around these NFTs. So I reached out to um, an artist and for just about 25 bucks, I had them take that, uh, one of those baseball cards we did, the one at the Royal Bread Factory and turn it into like a vector uh, turn it into a vector graphic, which is predominantly what you see NFTs being used for. Uh, now, there's a lot more to an NFT than just the art that's part of it. Uh, you can attach like hidden files to the NFT. So only the owner of the NFT would be able to access this information. So we could upload things like um, historic pictures of the building, 
um, documentation about the building and the building's history, uh, video of the building, so on and so forth, and come up with a collection of like five or six of these, and you use the service. Uh, the one I'm familiar with is OpenSea, and you put those. It's as long as you use what's called the Polygon side chain, you can create the NFT for free pretty much other than whatever we'd have to spend for the artist to create the graphic and attach um, those files to the NFT and you put it up for auction as like a collection. Um, and people can bid on individual NFTs for a specified amount of time. And then they, they pay for it in cryptocurrency. Uh, and some of these NFTs uh, on OpenSea, they go for like $40 million, $10 million. And it's literally just here. I'll, I'll drop you a link in the chat to show you like the most expensive collection. So you can see just, and it looks ridiculous. Like these are very low effort pieces of artwork, but the secret behind it is if you own one of these pieces, uh, you can have access to special communities and events. Think of it as like a season ticket. Um, I think for this particular collection, they had like something up in New York city where they rented a yacht. And if you owned one of these, um, NFTs, you were able to board the yacht and go for a cruise and social and mingle with people. So there's a lot of things you can do with NFTs. But the, I think given the mission that we have with preserving um, historic landmarks and that we do need funds uh, to have a better shot at preserving any structures, particularly given the, uh, res or the um, real estate market right now, this could be a way for us to raise some money. And I think it would cost like, Maybe, I think the artist told me it would be about $200 for him to make uh, five more or six more of these. And I can make the NFT myself without much of any trouble. Uh, the challenges that I think we would run into uh, would be on the accounting side. So once we've got the crypto in hand, I do have an LLC that could handle converting the crypto to fiat and then donating that to the organization as long as uh, any of the expenses involved in that in terms of tax liability are covered. But if there's a way that we could do it through the, um, the nonprofit account that we have, there is a chance that we could avoid those tax implications on whatever we did earn. Uh, but this would be just very early stage, just checking your temperature on the idea and if you'd be interested. I'm very, I'm, I think that this is like very creative. I'm very intrigued by like the possibilities here, especially I think because of the contrast between like this emerging technology and historic preservation. Um, I feel like this could be something that we could do probably outside of this event though. I think because there'd be a lot of consumer education involved, like I don't know how many people are familiar with NFTs and like if we were, I mean, we could position it as being part of this event if we wanted to move forward on it. But I think, you know, broadcasting it outwardly, like, um, and expanding the audience. But I think the people who are attending this event, like the idea of an NFT might be inaccessible to them. I don't want to not give people credit, but <laughs> I feel like most people don't know what NFTs are. Well, just keep in mind, um, if we were to do it the, to do this, you don't have to be in person to bid. So anybody that has access to that website um, could bid it up. It's but you're right. I mean, it's not something like my grandmother. I could tell her, "Hey, check out these NFTs on Raleigh Landmarks," and she'd know exactly how to go and bid. It's it it takes a little bit of techie know how. Um, to pull it off, but there is a very, very active community out there of people bidding up and buying these things right now. Do you know yeah. if that yeah. community is in Raleigh? Like how active is that community in Raleigh? Are you, do you know? Uh, I do know of one, uh, there's a couple of crypto groups in Raleigh. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of like them bidding it up, I'm not sure. 
However, I have been following crypto markets pretty closely since the pandemic began. There are very few, if any, examples of like a government associated body trying to do something like this. And if we were to publicize it, there would be a good chance that it would anything to do with crypto like this. That's kind of like a new use case or unheard of, or, um, traditional entities adopting cryptocurrency type solutions gets a lot of buzz on yeah. very quickly. I um, was thinking I, that. I was, I was thinking, thinking that. Of, oh, you go ahead, Heather. No, go ahead, Katie. It's okay. Oh, I, I was just going to say that. Um, yeah, I think if we were to move forward with this, like that focus would definitely need to be on that online community. But I do think that people would be really intrigued by historic preservation via NFT fundraising and how that is transferable to many well, other Well, we could also make that part of well. our 60th anniversary plug. You know, we've been doing this for 60 years. It's old structures, but we're in the, oh, yeah. are we in the 21st century still? Yeah, I guess so. Um, <laughs> so, uh, but in terms of, um, you know, swag that we've handed out at previous events. I know that we had some RHDC basically business cards that, um, you know, we tell people go look at our website, but if we hand them a card, they know exactly where to go. So they could plug into Raleigh Historic, um, you know, get to know our app. If we've got an NFT fundraiser, even if that's a temporary thing, we could definitely link to that at our online sources too. So it's not, I guess it would be um, kind of run online, but at this in-person event, we could definitely kick people to it. And with enough people, um, like in our disclosure event, um, that's centered around art, um, that could be a pretty cool concept to promote at that event. Um, not to push us back to that um, without consensus, but we have five minutes left in our standard meeting. And what I'd like to, at least pursue today is date, time, place, mm -hmm. and then we can figure out what our booth looks like and what activities we're offering um, and really dig into that piece in January. Yeah, I agree. So um, I, on that note, I do like this idea of NFTs, um, pretty much everything Katie said. Um, it's really interesting, You like a historic organization utilizing like modern tech in this way. And I do think it could get a lot of buzz. I do think, again, it would be mostly an online thing, but we could kind of talk about it at the table. Um, it sounds like we're all sort of discussing this as if we're doing our exposure, but can we go ahead and confirm, is that what everyone wants to do? Are we cool with having like a really cool table at our exposure as our 60th anniversary and our preservation month thing combined I'm down with so. that and yeah props to Aaron for thinking about <laughs> we're having an executive committee meeting on Thursday and we can receive their recommendation and commit on behalf of the full commission or get the full commission at the two weeks to commit I just need to know the dates and how much it would cost for the booth mm -hmm. yep that that would be yeah the cost and the thing i would want to know is um also can we talk to our disclosure about getting in their actual guidebook because i i do think it'd be great if we have a table but we do something oh, God. so no will is saying someone's knocking at my door it's my dog go nuts um so, <laughs> so quick little quick quick little info as we were googling it uh doing you know looking up some additional uh, information while you were talking um, it doesn't look like we can actually have a booth at Art Explosure because we are not artists, but I think we could do something nearby and but do it during that um, during could that we, weekend. Could we do get... it at the core museum then? Because I know that was go. that was one of our ideas. Staff will reach out to the the City of Raleigh Museum staff. Um, and we'll we'll investigate. So maybe rather, you know, just say arts. Refer to it as art explosure weekend. Yeah, 
I like that. We could be in the museum and like out spilling out from the museum. And I know core museum tends to try to get involved with that kind of stuff anyway. So, but we then would have all that space that we could use and do a few more extra things because we're in there. So um, I think that sounds good. Is everyone good with that? Doing something in core museum on, on art exposure weekend? Yeah. yeah. Yes. It, it, just a thought occurred to me, it might be something, um, and Travis, I, I like the technology idea you had, and I'm sorry I haven't been able to get back with you. Um, you know, our baseball card images, I know they're, they would have to be boosted and recomposed to, to make printing standards, but suppose we printed some posters. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I agree with that. I think that if possible. paper, like, uh, Figure out a way to, you know, whatever dimensions are, are acceptable. Some people go big and I prefer smaller, but, but you could come somewhere in the middle in that and something to sell and promote history by you know, having a, a so, so, this size. So, Gaston, actually, let me, tell you, let me tell you, for uh, I'm on the Friends of Paige Walker for the town of Cary. Um, and we have been selling photographs of historic structures. And they have been selling, we, we've we made hundreds of dollars selling um, photos of historic structures. Uh, we sell them as pictures. Uh, we sell them as posters. We sell them as um, like postcards or like Christmas cards. Uh, I 100% think we should do something like that if if uh, we're allowed to do that. And, and the, the, the. Uh, it's it's not terribly expensive to reproduce. It depends on how elaborate you want to be, whether you want it on archival paper, but it's not as expensive as it used to be. And those those antique images, the antique looking images on our cards, I think are really cool. Mm -hmm. so, I agree. Know, could, if you were a history buff, you could have a quad, you know, you could have four of them in a house. It would look really neat if you were kind of new to Raleigh and wanted something. Definitely. We, yeah, we, so we definitely, we're going to have a meeting probably next meeting and talk about what we will do at the event. Um, but as Aaron said for today, let's just agree to, we're planning for core museum. We're planning for May 21st or 22nd or possibly both. Um, and the time, um, what do you guys think? Maybe like, so art disclosure on Saturday, I believe it goes from 11 a.m. to 7 p.m. On Sunday, it goes from 10 a.m. And that first hour is exclusive early entry for those with accessibility needs, um, 10 a.m. to 7 p.m. Um, I will throw it out there that I've got something unbreakable on my calendar for Saturday night that involves family coming into town. So I have no idea how early in the day I will no longer be available to assist, but I'm wide open um, Sunday, I believe. But that I also, if, if if you wanted to cover, you know, a full day of art disclosure or a f both full days of the festival, um, there's always, uh, you know, time slots where we could do pairs of commissioners to cover the booth and people wouldn't need to be there all day. Yeah, plus, plus, if we're at core museum, I think, you know, we'll have us there, of course, but we'll have their staff are also going to be there probably doing stuff. We'll maybe talk to them about what kinds of teaming up we can work on. And I mean, doing this, we could have burning coal theater come do something. We could have things happening at different times. You know, at 3 o'clock, we have the theater thing at 4 o'clock. We have a talk about history. Um, we could really we could really amplify this utilizing that traffic. I personally think we should aim to be there all day Saturday from 11 to 7. Um, I can just be there all day. I have no issue with that. I'll just ask off work. How about I'll we, how about, about we do with those details next time? Okay. I think we're getting the cart ahead of the horse. <laughs> okay. That's fair. Okay. But we, we do know that we're doing it on uh, art exposure weekend and we're aiming for core museum. I think that's good. That, for now. that sounds good. So I will go out of this meeting with an action item to contact core museum and see about using their space. Um, and depending on what they say, we'll come up with a couple of alternative options for you all to consider in January. Um, so we can nail something down at the next meeting. Sounds good. 
thank you all so much. You've had such good ideas. I'm really excited. I'm, I think we're going to have a really, really awesome uh, 60th anniversary event. So I'm really pumped for it. All right. Uh, I guess we can end the meeting. Thanks, everybody. Bye, everyone. Have a have a good December and happy happy Christmas. <laughs> oh, I got one quick question. Too late. Never mind. Bye bye. <laughs> okay. <laughs> See you guys. Well, the quick question would have been for Travis. I think he's gone. But anyway, the 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 image that we would create that we would sell in the crypto world, it can be something we create for that purpose it doesn't have to be historically something we've already done we wouldn't lose intellectual property rights on it uh, if we created for that purpose we wouldn't lose the ability to use it forever and all time or we could structure it so that we sold it and it's not unique to the nft doesn't mean you lose the ip for the the art unless you specify i i mean there's no legal framework around this stuff so I mean, I don't see them having any recourse unless we specifically said in the NFT, like this NFT includes the intellectual property rights to the graphic contained. Um, people utilize NFTs and publish the art all over the place. People have NFTs that are just screenshots of like, I think one of them was the first tweet ever made by the CEO of Twitter. So there's, there's no limitations, so to speak. Got it, Gaston. It's a, it's a brave new world. A friend of mine who's fully capable of explaining things simply that are complicated <laughs> gave me a 20 minute lecture on cryptocurrency. And I said, this sounds like financial musical chairs to me. Who in the hell would ever put a whole lot of money in? But then there are a lot of, I think, never mind. Yeah, just <laughs> wait till you look at the tax implications for selling cryptocurrency for US dollars. That's the oh, fun Lord. part. It's fascinating as a human being. If you don't understand it, it's okay. Just accept what they're telling you as something. Well, I'm anyways, logging I look... off, guys. I got to get back to work. Bye. Yeah, y'all. I got to run yep. to the bus. Looking forward to talking more <laughs> with y'all. Thank y'all. See ya. Bye now. Bye.